Bill and Leanne and, and Pete and Carter are going to be working with me initially. And um, we're going to, these bags will hold the, the plugs when we pull, the, pull them out. When we pull a bird out, we'll remove the plug. And uh, we're the other, we're going to take one bird per unit where the other one can continue feeding. And I think we're going to do one system first and take out seven or eight birds. Um, we have, oh, thank you. Yeah, here's more bags. You got plenty. They're, um, the lower facing the trailer, that arm on the bottom starts one and two behind it, and then above it is three and four. And then we move counterclockwise around to the west, uh, five and six, seven and eight. And then the next here is nine, 10, 11, 12. How we positioned our ladders. First stage, uh, there were two people on each ladder. So one person went up and uh, plugged the, the gourds that were marked. Then they moved the ladder to two. This one started here. We were trying to block off, and the gourd entrances are facing the, the direction of the black arrow. And we were trying to block the other birds from seeing the other system and flushing them. And we were taking into account whether they were occupied, and most of them are. Raise the system, let it st st stabilize for five minutes or so and then use the string to pull the plug out. So that's gourd seven. I would like to get, if we have adults in that, and some of the nestlings, one of them's like 25 days old, they fledge when they're 26. Um, the parents may not be staying in there. How do they actually get there? Um, are they crossing, going down the Florida and crossing the Gulf? Are they crossing the Gulf somewhere else? Are they going all the way in through Mexico? That sort of thing. And then once they go to Brazil, we're, we're able to tell that from geolocators. Uh, the geolocator project that we run is very closely partnered with York University, uh, Dr. Richard Stutchberry. Um, it's been a great project and we've gotten a lot of really good results from it. So what is a geolocator? This, this is the stock of a geolocator. The actual geolocator is underneath the bird's feathers. Um, and what it is, is a computer chip. What a computer chip does is there's a light detector on it. So right at the very tip of that stock, you can actually kind of see it here, it's a little piece of silver. And what that does is it detects the time that the sun comes up and the time that the sun goes down. The, it's just a data logger. It just collects that, that data of when the sun goes up and when it goes down. So um, you guys have probably heard that back in the day sailors would look at the sun and see where it was and from that they could tell where they were on the globe. That's how this works. Um, the time that the sun comes up gives east and west and then the time that the sun goes down gives us the day length. So from the day length we can tell north and south because of the tilt of the earth. But like I said, it's just a data logger. It doesn't actually transmit data to us, so it's not a GPS unit. Um, hopefully that will eventually show up, but right now they're all too big. Okay. Okay. Oh, why are we putting this plug back in the Keep gourd? the little ones to, from jumping. And, and uh, when we put it back up, we'll lower the string down, raise the rack, and let it settle down, let them calm down, and then we'll pull, pull it out the string. So there are nestlings in this right. gourd? Huh? There, there are nestlings right. in this gourd? Old, old nestlings. Fledge egg. Okay, we have bags of bags. I'll get the picture on the next one. Oh, okay. I'm pissed off in there, aren't they? Does anyone want to see? 
say what a bird in the bag is worth? Okay, that goes to the close one. I think we'll pull this when we when we get ready to raise. And you have a did you get, is one in there? No. Oh, okay. But I'll go ahead and she may come flying out. You we're gonna go over here. I don't think there's a female in here. ASYF. John, how do you decide which bird you take out to put a locator on? You just, just take just the first. You just take the first one you get, or. No. So now I'm going to take the longest string, which is this one here, and I'm going to loop that over the front of that leg, pull a few of the feathers out of the way, and then bring it back around. See that? That's looking pretty good. And I'm going to bring it back to center, and I'll go under that wing again. And there. Now I've got it on the back. And it should be good. We're going to check to make sure it's in the right place again before we do any final gluing or anything serious like that. It looks like it's pretty well centered. And then, conveniently, the size of the, this mechanical pencil is right about the size we need for getting the right tension. So we want it to be tight, but not too tight. So that just works out to be, if I can get that there, that works out to be a good, good spacer. It gives us something to tie against and makes sure we're not going to tie it too tight on this bird. So I'm going to pull that and snug, and I'm going to tie the first official knot. Okay. Now let's take that pencil out and let's have a look and see how, how things look on this bird. Okay, good job. That's still up in there where it should be. And it's still up in there where it should be. And it looks nicely centered on her back. And you see there's a bit of a, a bit of a wiggle, but not, not too much. So it's, when I, when I pull this back and forth, it's pulling feathers and things with it. It's not moving independently, sliding around the back. That tells us that that's a pretty good, pretty good tension there. So let's make sure that's tied. Let's see what I'm happy with that. John, could you explain what he's doing now with the file right. on the gourd? Filing the, the lip, the groove, where the geolocator on the back of the bird will go in without it hitting the geolocator. Right. So we're taking the birds off the clothesline. Step one. So we're taking a, a weight measurement, but we also want to know if particular birds are big for their structural size, so if they weigh more for, for how big they are. So we're taking other measurements like 
uh, the length of their leg and the length of their wing to see if a, a bird is particularly heavy or not for its size, and that can give us an indication of, of condition. So that first measurement was the diameter of his leg? It was the length, the length of, his, of, his, of what's called his tarsus. So that should be a good indication of the overall structural size of the bird. And then we can see, is this bird heavy for its size? So is it carrying a lot of fat? Is it in good condition? Or is it light for its size? Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll kind of be in your face as we go along. <laughs> that's, that's I don't want to stress out the birds. Right? No, it'll be, it'll be fine. So now I'm going to take a blood sample from the brachial vein under the wing. And this is part of a larger range-wide genetic study that we're doing with these birds. That's what we're collecting the blood sample for. We're going to look at genes that control migration timing in birds. And we're going to see if there's variation in those genes across the range with the idea that birds further north might have lower genetic diversity because they have narrower timing and narrower schedules to match shorter breeding seasons in the north. Whereas here in the south, the breeding seasons are longer, breeding arrival times for migration are extended and more varied. And I think that's going to correspond to greater genetic variation. And from that, we think that birds in the north might be more at risk with climate change than birds in the south because they have lower variation in their genes and they're more on a knife edge of timing. So if we have more variable climate or earlier seasons, they're not going to be able to quickly adjust because their timing is controlled by, by things at a genetic level. This bird here, we're predicting, has more genetic diversity. That's important. Well, the first time that this has been looked at in, in any any migratory bird and any migratory animal of any kind. People have looked at, at migration timing genes in some salmon species, but they've only been able to look at arrival timing because they haven't been able to track salmon throughout the year. But we're tracking these birds throughout the, the entire year so we can see how genes control timing right from when they leave South America all the way to when they get to their breeding sites. It's about 90 for that one. As I said, optically intimate here. And then the number 90 is, what's that? That's just to give me, a, uh, just the percentage of the cap tube that I fill with blood. I'm aiming to get 100%. So full cap tube on each one, but I'm just recording the general amount that I'm able to get with each, with each breed. But even if I only get, you know, half a cap tube, I still have lots of, still have lots of DNA in here to work with for the, for the study. I found a party gourd. It had two males, two females in it, all different ages. Well, that's a woohoo gourd. A party, party kiss. And two of them were already banded. Yeah. Yeah. They were babies here last year. Oh, neat. Party gourd. <laughs> okay. Okay. Would you mind holding this for me while I collect yeah. some feather samples? Thanks. I'm going to try to clip some little feather bits and get them right into, right into there. Nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. So one thing we don't really know too well about martins is where they molt. Okay. So we'll have an annual okay. molt where they'll go through two, three, four, five, six. They'll go through a complete molt of all of their flight feathers. And a lot of birds will do that at their breeding sites before they leave. But it seems like martins start at their breeding sites and then continue on six, five, four, three, either en route on migration, which would slow them down and make them have to stop part way, or they might finish their molt when they get to South America. 